All right, so thanks to everyone um, for joining us today. I got a couple notes. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read off of. Um, uh, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Tom Levy. Uh, I'm a senior science and technology advisor with the Office of Energy Research and Development, and uh, I, I essentially split my time between renewables and smart grid. Um, I've got I'm closing in on 20 years experience in wind energy, which is kind of scary um, on a number of different levels. Um, and, and, and it's moved from, from straight up uh, development work and, and, and just getting steel in the ground to uh, getting into grid integration and then increasingly smart grid and, and the, the interface between the energy system and the end user. Um, so uh, from, from those 20 years, I've got, I've got you know, kind of split my time between, between consulting. I spent six years at Canwea. Um, and then from Camwe, I moved to Cam Energy Ottawa, which is an OERD funded lab where I led the wind R&D group that Ryan is now leading um, and, and following my move to OERD. So for, for this final presentation series for the Wind Energy Research Network, we've got a topic that um, frankly, I think it can take a number of different directions. And, and today, uh, you know, in this series, they're mostly looking at assessing potential damage during operations, um, determining the best timing regarding remaining useful life, when to replace versus repair, uh, run it to the ground, um, or, or 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 replace proactively before something um, gets too far along the uh, the, the damage uh, side of things. Um, do owners uh, how do, how do owners make those decisions? Um, and when we start thinking about projects that are coming off their PPAs, I think you know depending on how much time is left in the PPA, those decisions become uh, increasingly important. Um, and, and what sort of decisions owners need to make when they, when they start thinking about where to go next. Um, early days of the wind industry, when, when Rob was, was pushing uh, all sorts of different policies and approaches that got more wind in the grid, it was really about increasing the penetration of wind energy to meet uh, carbon reduction goals. And, and, and nothing has really changed in that regard. Um, but the tools and approaches to, to looking at getting more uh, increased penetration um, uh, is going to vary over time, uh, especially now as penetration starts rising. We see that in a number of countries. The approach to how wind is used um, uh, is changing. And so, you know, now though, we've got projects that are getting older. There's implications such as declining availability and efficiency, retirement of specific wind turbines in a farm, uh, repowering. Um, those, are, those are decisions that made in this regard is going to have implications for utilities in their planning. Um, and then, of course, broader policy implications related to net zero targets. So there's a lot packed in there um, uh, that, that I think is of interest um, to, to a number of different stakeholders. Um, of particular interest to me uh, in this area is assessing and understanding, um, or I'd say better understanding the impact of uh, on the asset as a whole or individual components when we're asking them to do more than just maximize their energy production. And of course, if you look at the IEC standards, um, those IE standards and, and, and certifications under those are all about you know, tip speed ratio and, and maximizing production. Um, but now that these projects are getting, um, uh, sorry, but the impact now is we ask them to change their role in the grid. So for example, um, what is the impact on major components when wind, tur when wind turbines are increasingly participating in ancillary services, service markets, um, which is what we're seeing contemplated in Nova Scotia right now. Uh, the PPA has changed, uh, the, the, the interconnection uh, requirements have changed. Um, and, and what is that gonna do to the turbine? Um, I don't think we have the data yet, but, but I think we're gonna start amassing that over time and, and maybe something to think about next year um, or, or in future years. Um, and I think another area that is up and coming, and I've heard Ryan say it, and I think it's good, is it's, it's a little late to the party. You should have been thinking about this a while back, but, but we're starting to now, uh, so better late than never, uh, is end of life disposal and recycling. Um, we're seeing an increased level of interest in what to do with those blades that are out there. Um, it's a growing issue. Um, Environment Canada and climate change is starting to think about that uh, as well. Um, end of life issues uh, as it's related to a circular economy. Um, so those are, those are a number of areas that asset uh, management can, can come into play. And, and there's, as, as I kind of said at the outset, there's a, there's a lot of directions this can take. So, uh, but that's going to be enough for me for now. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pass the conch to Phil, uh, who, who I think from you, Phil, we're going to dive right into the presentations. I'll just say in terms of housekeeping, 
Um, I think what we've seen is, you know, if you've got a burning question, um, raise your hand and let's let's ask it on the fly after after presentation. Um, but but if you can hold it uh, or put it in the chat, uh, that's uh, that works as well. Um, but uh, we'll we'll see how things go. So uh, over to you, Phil. Great, thanks, Tom. And uh, hopefully you've got a view of my screen here. I'll run through our slides. Um, but just by way of introduction, my name is Phil McKay. I am the Senior Director for Operations at the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. So we're the National Association for Wind, Solar and Energy Storage in Canada. Uh, I'm coming from a, a background in uh, thermodynamics in the automotive industry, spent some time in Detroit uh, doing automotive design um, and then did uh, my master's at the University of Windsor with Dr. Caravo and Dr. Ting. Um, so that was kind of my first introduction. After that, got some time in at the Wind Energy Institute of Canada uh, as well. So spent some time as a junior engineer there doing some testing and, uh, and finally ending up here. Um, as you we were talking about earlier, I've been working on operations uh, when we were calling it O&M uh, a few years ago at Canwea, and as we merged into Canria to take on more technologies, we've moved to uh, this whole life cycle approach. So construction right through to decommissioning uh, with the operations bit in the middle uh, as well. So we've got uh, committees working on each aspect of that, including grid integration. We do a lot of health and safety workforce development stuff too, uh, and then uh, try to get industry around these topics to start either talking shop between each other or uh, talking in a forum like this. So uh, this, this forum has been really great to see rising up. Um, we do want you to try to share the word on this as well. Tell your colleagues so that we can get more membership coming out. I'm not... I'm not going to read through all this. This might be your fifth time actually seeing this presentation. Uh, we've been uh, deliberate as a steering committee to make sure this gets in front of you so you can see the big picture goals for creating this forum uh, and accelerating uptake. Um, I was also thinking that as we list out these uh, groups that are involved, um, colleges aren't on here and we, we talk about uh, applied research as well. And I think that also goes to what Tom was saying we're at this point where um, there's, a, there's still fundamental research to do, there will always be that, but it's that bridge, that applied research of, okay, we've got a technology, we're not starting from scratch, but we need to deploy more of it. And there are all these dynamics uh, to that that we should be uh, cognizant of. Um, so this is the annual meeting uh, for this. So trying to do this at least once a year. Um, certainly think it's a, a great approach from an industry perspective, um, similar to a utilities, having a one place to go, a summary document, some, some place where they don't have to, or industry doesn't necessarily need to tease out everything, right? They can come in and dedicate a little bit of time once a year to something like this, rather than uh, trying to harv, uh, or carve out time from their day job, uh, weekly, monthly, whatever. Um, here's the, the steering committee list as well. So you can see we've got good representation from Enercan through Ryan um, as well. Now we've got Tom on the line uh, moderating today's call um, from the University of Windsor, uh, Rup Carvo and Lindsay Miller. Bren Novaki, which I don't actually know how often she goes by that last name. Um, Charles from Nergica, and then Scott and Marianne at Weekend as well. And then finally, here's the outline of what you missed. Uh, too late, sorry. Uh, all these things happened already, but as, uh, as Marianne has noted throughout, these are being recorded uh, and you'll have access to them later. So we're on day five here, asset management. Um, I won't introduce the topic anymore as Tom has done a great job there hitting on a, a bunch of uh, highlights that we hope to talk about. Um, and uh, I, I guess I would say, or just wrap up by saying that asset management is that, that bridging piece that I'm keen to learn more about as we talk about uh, research and everybody on the line here who is doing really great work across the country, uh, very keen to see that applied to Canada's problems, to uh, Canada's context, in the sense that we we don't house all the big wind turbine OEMs here. They're not uh, doing that design shop here. Maybe they're modifying some things 
uh, out of their Montreal office or something, but um, we have uh, some really unique challenges in the Canadian space. And so this topic here is particularly interesting to me. So Tom, I'll throw it back to you to uh, kick off some of these presentations. Thanks, Phil. Um, and Marianne, I think you're gonna get Dex up or, or is uh, Majid, uh, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it directly over to Majid. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Okay. I hope that now everyone can see my screen. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Majid Moshe Zadeh. I am the Wing System Reliability Research Engineer here at Weekend. Today, I'm going to briefly talk about IEA wind task number 46, which is about wind turbine blade erosion. Um, so I'm going to start with an overview of the task. Uh, basically, uh, leading edge erosion has been identified as a major factor in blade lifetime, uh, ma uh, maintenance costs, overall power production reduction, so the objective of the task is to understand the impact of leading edge erosion on the performance of the wind plants and determine the cost and benefit of any proposed mitigation strategies. The expected outcome of the task or literature surveys, topical reports, recommended practices and models. And this is a four year project, which is currently in its second year. So, a little bit of Rican's experience and why we're involved. So we're located at the northwest uh, tip of Prince Edward Island, which has uh, like a 300 degrees of ocean, uh, which brings a lot of wind, which is great, but it's also a very corrosive and harsh environment. We have applied leading edge protection since 2016 when we basically applied four different products. We repaired them in 2019, and now we are basically applying a new product. Uh, so we are basically kind of on a three-year cycle here. So we know a thing or two about leading edge erosion. Uh, there are more than 10 countries participating in this task, mainly European countries but we're representing Canada and to our contracting party and our camp. Uh, there are five work packages in this project, four of which are technical, which are clim climatic conditions, wind turbines operation with erosion, laboratory testing of erosion and erosion mechanics and materials properties. Our involvement is for uh, um, basically with two work packages, work package two and three, which we bring uh, data analytics field expertise. And uh, the work package three, which is our main involvement, uh, has five uh, different subcategories, which are AEP loss modeling, uh, standardization of damage reports, uh, droplet impeachment model, uh, potential for erosion safe mode operation and uh, validation of uh, models based on field observations. A little bit of a uh, report on the progress so far on this board package number three for the damage standardization, uh, six different cla erosion classes have been. Uh, proposed, as you can see, from zero to five. Uh, and these are based on the severity of damage and under four different categories that you can see on the first column of this table, which are visual data definition, mass loss, aerodynamics, and structural damage. For each of them, a uh, definition, if you will, have been proposed uh, to basically categorize these damages. As an example, uh, the eroded blade that you see on these images on the right, with these parameters provided um, in this table on the basically on the bottom left, 
has been given these uh, different classes for the, the four different categories that I mentioned earlier, and to basically create a cheat sheet, if you will, for, uh, for damage standardization. And it's just an example. On the AEP loss, uh, generally it's very challenging to precisely quantify the power loss due to blade erosion. And that's because of the seasonal effects. Uh, there could be multiple issues affecting the power. And also when you reach the rated wind speed, uh, it's very hard to see any basic effect of eroded blades on the power because you are producing at full power. So you have to stick to the region below rated power. Uh, we have done a collaborative analysis of with NREL and Texas a and uh, which has been recently published in Wind Energy, trying to address uh, these issues through data-driven modeling. Uh, this is uh, open source, this is an open source paper which can be accessed through a uh, widely online library. Uh, uh, so, and but it's an ongoing uh, basically effort to, uh, to come up with uh, a, like a generalized model to, to, for a P loss model. And that basically brings me to the end of my presentation. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to address them or you can contact me at any time. Uh, and thank you. Thanks for your attention, uh, Tom. Majid, I was about to pull the hook and say you're going over time, but you ended just perfectly on time. Uh, thank you for that. Um, any uh, any burning questions that can't wait for the discussion? Just take yourself off mute and uh, going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, lovely, uh, Charles. I think we're going to hand things over to you to uh, to hear about Nergica's experiences installing load measurement systems in wind turbine blades. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, I, everyone, been listening in so far, but very interesting. Um, and yeah, I'm going to uh, set up my screen here. And uh, that. Give me a second for the screen sharing bit. All right, everyone sees the screen now? Yeah. Great, yeah, so I uh, wanted to talk to you today about some, uh, some experiences we've had installing low measurement systems in a wind turbine. Um, <clears throat> it's a project we've done at our research site uh, based in Gaspé, Quebec. So, some of you may be familiar with the infrastructure we have. Uh, so Nergica, we're a college affiliated uh, research center um, and we own and operate a research site which has two, uh, two megawatt wind turbines. We'll talk more about them later. <clears throat> Some MetMast uh, microgrid, uh, PVs, LIDARs, and all the data is pushed to uh, OSI SoftPy. So uh, we've been operating the sites for 12 years now. Um, we've instrumented our WEC-1 wind turbine. We like to refer to it as the Christmas tree because there's so much stuff in that turbine. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, but it's, uh, so it's a Sendion MM92 cold climate version. It's a rated power of 2 megawatts of height, 80 meters. It's been commissioned in 2010 and as an operator, we also have the same concern as um, what Tom shared at the beginning of the session about, you know, what are we doing, going to do with this. Uh, in Quebec, there's the specific context that Hydro-Quebec and the Ministry of Natural Resources have kind of um, showed their cards and let the operators know that they want ideally to extend the wind farm life 
to five to 10 years. And so our PPA ends in 2030. So that means, you know, if we're looking into extending the life of our turbine by five to 10 years, are we you know, able to operate up to 2040? So that's one of our concern as a kind of operator perspective. Um, and we're, you know, our site is located in complex terrain with moderate, moderate icing. And we have an average wind speed of eight meters per second. So it's not the most um, challenging site in terms of wind resource, but still some complex terrain and, and icing effects. And so why are we looking into load measurement? Well, um, that's basically Tom's intro right there. So uh, the Canadian wind fleet is aging. Uh, starting 2026, several wind farms will reach the end of their PPA. And so, we'll, <clears throat> you know, what will happen with those wind farms? Are we decommissioning its thing in life or repowering? Um, we want to, you know, look at those questions and, and uh, support, you know, the wind energy industry to tackle those decisions and, um, yeah, choose, you know, if you're, for example, what type of instrumentation should you select? How do you calculate the accumulated damage on, on key components, stuff like that. So that's one area of research we're interested in. So the, the let's say end of life of uh, current wind farms. And then the other one is load-based control. And so, uh, if you want to extend your wind turbine life, then why not try and limit the loads on its critical components? Um, it, I'll be showing some commercial solutions. So I think there's there's a, some options on the market now, which are you know, relatively simple to, to install, fairly simple um, systems. And um, you know, we wanna work with those technology developers uh, to kind of, um, develop some maybe load management control uh, for, for aging uh, wind turbines. So that's for the, let's say, aging part. And then there's icing as well. So um, I guess my main area of research now has been cold climate and icing. And as some of you may know, the most um, applied control for those is um, aerodynamic performance degradation. So basically you measure a power loss with the power curve. And at some point you decide that there's too much icing that is dangerous for your asset. Uh, what we found so far is that actually what icing does is it reduces the aerodynamic performance of the blade. And actually before our turbine gets stopped by, by icing, it's actually, there's less loads on it. So, <laughs> Um, we'd like to push that limit and be able to produce more energy in icing. So that's another thing we want to do with those. Um, <clears throat> so what have we installed? We've installed the three measurement systems in uh, WEC1 last year. First one you have on the left side is uh, Phoenix Contact Blade Intelligence. It's, uh, it's a small, um, yeah, load cell in, um, you know, standard strain gauge. It's encapsulated in epoxy. And so it's, uh, as they say, a wind technician approved sensor. And because it's, it's encapsulated, it's resistant, it's plug and play. So you just have, the, you have the, this wire coming out and you kind of just plug into the, the control box. And as you can see on the top image there, uh, there's, uh, there's four sensors per blade. So you measure the two main axes of the blade, so that would be the flap wise and edge wise. <clears throat> then we have the Backman cantilever sensor, which is basically the same um, philosophy, except that instead of a located um, strain gauge, you have this kind of moving arm. The idea behind it being that um, wind turbine blades are uh, um, composite uh, material, they have non-homogeneous uh, properties. And so let's say you would install a very small strain gauge, but you would end up on dry glass, for example, on your blade, uh, the location of your strain gauge would kind of not 
really reflect the load on the whole structure. Whereas with this sensor, which is about 30 centimeters long, uh, the idea is that you have a, you're less dependent on the exact location on the composite if so the defect, for example, or stuff like that. But general principle remains the same. You measure uh, deformation uh, of the material. <clears throat> and we also went with um, IEC 61400 compliant load measurement system. Um, it was installed by a, uh, a company called um, Simutech Group, which some of you may know. They're doing ANSYS load validation, but they also have a group in the States where they've worked on um, turbine certification, for example, with GE. Uh, this is a more complex system. We have, you know, measurement in the tower, nacelle, main shaft, blades. I've put the details in the appendix. So, uh, you know, if you have question about this, we can go over. But I, I don't have time right now to to go into what we have with this. Um, wanted to share some of the learnings we made through this and how we proceeded, and kind of, uh, yeah, just sharing our general experience with this. So you got like a minute max. You're I've going got, over time. They're five minute presentations, right? I think I have 15. Oh, no, they're not. Oh, my apologies. I apologize. <laughs> Carry on then. Yeah. Yeah. On my end, I have like about seven minutes left. Is that okay? okay or? No, no, no. It's fine. Okay, good. Good. Phew. <laughs> Caught me by surprise there, Tom. Um, so, yeah. Um, while we try and, you know, plan those installations for, for the summer, it seems we always end up doing them in the winter. And so uh, just going on site in the winter takes takes a while. Uh, we have this this trooper, we call it. It's a it's a yeah, truck on tracks. What takes you know half an hour in the summer takes two hours in the winter. So uh, just uh, yeah, traveling with, with this uh, this trooper just takes a while. Um, we have seven kilometers uphill, so it takes a little while just to get there. Uh, then when doing this type of installation, there's quite a lot of work related to measurement markings and surface preparation. Uh, so what we have on the, on the left side here are um, tower markings. What we did is we took this uh, flexible fiberglass tape, taped it around the tower. You make sure it's level. And then you measure your circumference and you're able to do your clocking. Um, you have to consider some uh, turbine welds and obstacles. So for instance, at the base of the tower, we had to kind of make sure we were far enough from the door, from welds, from you know, some structural uh, parts that you have in the tower so that they don't interfere with your, um, with your gauges. And then in the blade, Kind of the same principle. You'll do your clocking um, with the trailing edge mark, and then you can unroll tape, and and then you can sand basically the surface so that you can apply the the epoxy and all that. And for the cantilever system, it was kind of neat. They had this uh, this plexiglass type of uh, um, yeah. A marking device <laughs> and then you just have holes and you can kind of draw what you need to to install it so it, it was it was um we like the 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 backman procedure they had the simplified marking devices and um, the curing was also simpler i'll get to that <clears throat> then there's working in a confined space so a blade uh, per definition is a confined space so you have to take into account those those health and safety a uh, request it's a kind of an um, yeah it's a nice view a neat view if you've ever been in a blade when it's sunny it's kind of kind of freaky because you kind of see through <laughs> but uh and then you have to consider air circulation and what i would recommend is also use high quality masks so we use those 3m's casket mask for when you're do doing sanding and stuff like that so um to make sure you you don't get uh yeah dust in, uh, in your lungs. <clears throat> then there's uh, cable management. So um, uh, we ended up, uh, we have this, this spring basically in between the, the, the blade bulkhead and the, the hub. 
and it allows to kind of manage the the, uh, the the cables and the and the pitch of the blade. And we ended up using those. Uh, there's like two two different sets of them. Those little cable tie anchors. Uh, those black ones were our high quality cable ties that Backman provided. They were very great, uh, great working with them. Otherwise, we just use plastic cable anchors and a lot of sick effects. It just takes more time, <laughs> but it uh, works quite well. Um, and it, it has the advantage of um, being replaceable. So if you have an issue with the cable at some point or you want to replace it, uh, we prefer to go with those. In the past, we used to just cover everything in Sikaflex, but then uh, those cables, they become kind of one purpose only. So uh, we prefer to go with those cable anchors. <clears throat> and then the fun part, that was the sensor gluing and curing. Uh, so uh, you're gluing to uh, fiberglass, so you have to, do, um, to use epoxy. The Phoenix contact system, it was using um, this type of black epoxy. It's a long setting epoxy, but we were doing this in, in cold temperatures. So we had to bring in um, eating mats and cure those for two hours. It was a kind of a pain, honestly. Uh, whereas the Backman sensor, they had the fast setting epoxy, which we, just, we could just cure with a heat gun. It was much easier to work with. So if you ever end up choosing epoxy for a blade um, and you're working in colder temperature, like we have here, uh, make sure to use fast setting epoxy and a heat gun. It's much easier to, to work with. Um, and so some of the lessons learned, uh, that's kind of my uh, is that time is limited uh, on a given day, you know, going on site, doing the health and safety meeting, climbing the tower, locking the rotor, setting up the confined space equipment and then, and then taking it all apart when you leave, uh, it takes a lot of time. And so it leaves little time to kind of do the actual work. Um, from our experience, it takes twice as long. So when a supplier says, oh, my you know, system is very simple, it's one day per blade. Well, typically, typically it's two days per blade. So let's just plan for extra day. Um, only bring the equipment required for the task. So the inside of a blade, it's a confined space and quickly becomes a mess if you bring too much gear. So if you're doing a specific task, just bring one small bag with what you need for it. Um, using the right tools. So uh, we used flexible measuring tape, uh, which works quite well. Always have that rag plus water and rubbing alcohol solution. It's kind of a, yeah, there's a lot of dust in the, in the in the blade and um, yeah if if you don't clean it before nothing will stick to it so your tape your epoxy everything so um, and use paint pens for the same reason instead of sharpies so in the beginning I was using sharpie and couldn't do any marking so paint pens works work much better um, cable management was the task that actually took the longer you know it's not that long to install the sensor as the cable management that's quite long. So good quality cable tie anchors were great or uh, just plastic cable tie anchors with Sikaflex. And then, yeah, gluing, curing, I already talked about it, but yeah, just choose an epoxy that can set with a heat gun instead of, of eating pads because that's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of work and, and uh, takes much longer. And uh, most importantly, stay safe and have fun. That's it for me. Thank you. I was lucky you had that extra time. I didn't cut you off in a minute. Charles, you had a lot of more interesting stuff to go through. So apologies for that. Um, no now the rest of them are 15 minutes, so I won't sit make that same mistake again. Uh, any burning questions? Uh, Charles, the, the two epoxies, um, you know, for ease of installation, the, the quick cure epoxy in cold climate is, uh, is, is better, as you say, or at least it's easier to install. You don't have to wait around for two hours with heating pads and whatnot. Uh, is there a, is there an implication on the lifespan of that epoxy then? I mean, is it, does it not last as long if you need to have your load sensors in place for, for a decade or so, because that's just part of your asset management. Is there, is there a trade-off that you have to make there? We look thoroughly at the, at the specs and um, if it were like a more structural 
usage than than maybe, but then the force, like the shear force, for example, when you look at the the spec sheet, you know, for the application, it's not um, it doesn't change the lifespan of the sensor, for example. Okay. If you were to use it for um, like a structural purpose, then then yes, they're a a, a bit less strong. Yeah. But uh, for for the purpose of setting a sensor, it's it's not uh, not, not affecting the lifetime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, there's a hand up, Grant. Oh, sorry, the camera's not working. But yeah, that, that thanks, Charles. That was a really interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question. So at the beginning, you were talking about using the use load management uh, or the use load measurements to to look at the. Um, remaining lifespan and whether you can expand, extend the time. And so I'm wondering, um, have you, I, I'm not sure what the, the time frame is on this. I missed kind of when you, you set these up, but do you have any initial data or do you have an idea of, of how you might use this data or how long it might take to start getting some information that'll allow you to make those decisions about expanding, uh, extending the lifespan uh, of the, the turbines? Yeah, so um, the, we've had some discussions with operators here in Quebec. Uh, their their deadline or first deadline is 2026. That's when we have the first, I'd say, large uh, scale wind farms kind of uh, being the well, at least reaching the end of the PPA. <clears throat> um, you know, they they have a concern about how far do I need to go in instrumenting my turbine and understanding. Uh, how much remaining life I have. So um, they have concerns about tower foundations, tower, I guess the nacelle blades and all that stuff, it's, you can use repowering now. So some, some uh, turbine OEMs, they provide the repowering for the, yeah, the nacelle, the blade, the drivetrain, all that stuff. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> they're just not sure how, how much they should instrument to understand that, and if they're able to kind of link SCADA data with those uh, loads and accumulated damage. So I guess what, you know, the discussion we've had so far in terms of research was kind of to bridge the gap between what's the load on the machine and what's the SCADA data telling us. And if there's a way to kind of simplify their process so that they don't have to necessarily instrument their fleet, maybe just validate a few load cases on a couple of turbines per site, for example. Uh, so that was the discussion right now was kind of streamline the end of life analysis and leverage SCADA data as much as possible. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that question, Grant. Uh, thank you, Charles, for the presentation. We're gonna quickly move to Simon Parad Paradis, your, uh, your, your colleague at Nergica. It's Olivier that's going to present my name. <laughs> yeah, okay. Simon has uh, exchanged his, his place with, with okay. switch place. Don't, don't tell me I keep misreading the, the agenda. First the time, now the people, but no. Okay, good. Over to you, Olivier. Uh, can I share the screen? Uh, can you confirm that yeah, this is yeah, a presentation of the laser printer? Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Elvier Farinalbar. I'm the one who's going to present today. I'm also working at Nergica, uh, which is a renewable energy uh, energy center that Charles just presented. And I'm going to talk to you about a project we are currently doing with Colineo on blade inspection optimization. Uh, so you must know that uh, wind blade inspection and wind turbine expansion are mandatory and are a huge operation and maintenance requirement. They are doing so to ensure the structural integrity over the lifetime of the wind turbine, but also to evaluate the residual life and plan repairs to extend that residual life. So Colineo partnered up with us uh, because they are doing blade health monitoring. Uh, they are currently using a ground-based inspection technology uh, that you can see here. Uh, that looks like a telescope. Uh, this technology can inspect and detect cracks that are uh, with 
of one millimeters at a distance of 200 meters. Uh, it has a few perks, like it doesn't need to have technicians going up in the turbine or climbing on the blades. It's also easily deployed uh, in any environment and it can be used in a lot of uh, various uh, weather conditions. Uh, so it's a three years project and our objectives in this projects are to first enhance defect detection and classification using AI algorithms, because at the moment uh, it's only the technician on site uh, that detect with his eye and with the telescope if it has a defect on the blade. Uh, we also want to prioritize and schedule repairs based on the observation uh, on site and also to record and track over time the evolution of the defects on the blade. So uh, currently uh, our project looks like this. So first the defect detection uh, with AI or without AI is done on site and they record their information in a database. And from that database, we want to be able to extract the information we need to prioritize uh, defects and repairs, but we also want to record uh, the evolution of the, de uh, of the defects in time. So if we dig deeper in our first objective, which, uh, which is the defect detection with AI, uh, so we are using the GE nomenclature at, uh, at the moment. Uh, it is composed of 23 types of defects going from cosmetics and paint damages to uh, major damages and object impacts. So uh, there are a few examples here, uh, like leading edge erosion here on the blade, uh, cord wise crackings on the surface coating, and also deeper cracks on the blade and fiberglass. So uh, to be able to use AI to detect uh, those kind of defects, we first need to be able to detect blade elements and to be able to exclude those elements uh, from the AI. Uh, and what blade elements am I talking about? Are It's the labels that we see on blades, uh, the bolt rings at the root of the blade, and also vortex generators and zippers and other things like lightning like receptors. So for this first step, uh, we use a supervised pre-trained CNN model. And here, as you can see on the table on the left, uh, we were able to achieve great results uh, with average precision uh, above 96% for all blade element. That corresponds to uh, about uh, 0.95, uh, an F1 score of about 0.95 and over. Uh, we wanted to do something similar for uh, the blade defects, but with that kind of algorithm, uh, we weren't able to achieve great results. So we finally moved to a non-supervised learning model. So we used thousands and thousands of pictures with blades uh, without defects to be able to uh, to be able to uh, target and visualize uh, with the model things that could be considered defects or are not normal on a blade. So uh, I'm going to show you some examples uh, of the things we are able to see with uh, this algorithm. So on the left here, uh, you have the example without defects. So the, the black and white picture is the picture taken by the telescope on site. And this is the AI visualization. So without defects, there is nothing, but as you can see here on the right, uh, it's able to locate and highlight uh, things like the leading edge erosion that you see here. It was also able to detect small defects that uh, it that can be easily missed uh, with the telescope or, or with only the technician taking pictures. So, but you see here the, uh, the red region that locates uh, the small defects. And also it was able to point and pick up on things like missing vortex generators in some parts of the blade and also traces of repairs. Uh, like this here, uh, you have a leading edge repair and also you see the paintbrush here uh, of a, a paint job that is picked on by the AI. 
so with this AI, uh, but with those two AI algorithms, the next step, and that's what we are going to do this summer, is to use the AI in real time as a tool for the technician to be able to target and visualize defects on the blade and to be able to say if it should take a picture of that part of the blade and record it in the database. Uh, so this is for the first objective. The second objective is with the information we are able to get in the database to be able to prioritize the defects and the repair of the defects. So to do so, we made an algorithm of prioritizations. It is mainly composed on three parameters. So the deformation constraints on the blade, the defects type and the defects area. The deformation constraints are based on a 3D model we were able to construct uh, because we got so much information from wind turbine operators, uh, wind farm operators and other sources. So we were able to construct a uh, a good model and we were able to test it in operation and when the turbine is stopped like in a storm according to the IEC standards and the, the defects type and area are based on the field observation by the technicians or the operator that taking the pictures. Uh, so the deformation and constraints are based on blade element theory uh where we put in the information we have on the different layers and composites of the blade uh, we also have the different thickness of those layers and the twist of the blade along all the span so with these informations we were able to have the deformation in multiple sections of the blade and you can see here an example of one of those sections of the deformation uh, we also have the constraints in the blade uh, in a similar manner and with that, uh, we extrapolate those data to be able to make those mappings like you see here. So we have both sides of the wind blade, so downwind side and the upwind side, and we are able to locate uh, the regions where the deformation is the highest or similarly where the, the, the constraints are the highest. And by, combin uh, by combining those results with the data we have recorded in the database, we are able to visualize the defects uh, on this mapping. So to, to visualize where they are occurring and if it's in the region where, where the uh, deformation is high or if it's a region where the deformation is lower. And with that, we are able to prioritize based on the blade deformation or constraints at that in that region. Uh, also, we the two second parameters were the defect types and area. So we uh, we are taking the 23 kinds of defects uh, based on GE, and we are giving them a different weight based on their importance or their criticality and are they are or are they can move to to cause more problems so for example cosmetics has a lower importance than major damages we also take into account uh, the area of the defect so if it's a small part of the blade or if the damage cover a large area on the blade and by combining all those information, we are able to extract uh, Excel sheets like you see here. It's a, just an example to show you one side of the bed and only quadrants cracking, how we can differenti differentiate which would be more important. But the main goal of this tool is to be able, uh, is to, be able to work at multiple scale. So we are able to uh, locate the defects on blade that are more important, but we are also able to locate and target blades on a wind turbine that need uh, more repairs or even larger to be able to locate wind turbine in a wind farm that would need more repair uh, more rapidly. Uh, other criteria that I did not include, but that we do take into account is the location on the blade based on the blade composition of the blades. 
and also if this region of the blade is in tension or in compression. And uh, the third objective of, of this project is to record those defects over time and to track their evolution. Uh, we're still at the start of this process, uh, but the, the main goal of this objective is to be able to assess uh, the evolution of anomalies based on distance between anomalies. So if you have an example of one blade on a three years period, so 2019 to 2021, but we also have data from 2016 to today. So here you see uh, different years of blade inspection. And if we zoom in, uh, we can see that uh, some defects are very close to each other. And if we look at the pictures taken for those defects, uh, you can see the evolution over time. So I don't think it is clear in the first picture, but we do see a uh, cord wise cracking. But in 2021, the year after, we see that the coronavirus cracking are more apparent, showing the evolution of the defects in time. So uh, like I said, it, it's still early in the process, but what we want to achieve with this is to track the evolution over time, to be able to, uh, uh, to predict uh, if this uh, defects can be a problem uh, soon or later. And also we would want to use this information to prioritize the repairs of turbine based on their criticality on how they are or, or how they could evolve more critically. So the next steps uh, will be this summer when we will try the, the AI uh, for uh, defects detection with uh, the technicians on site and also uh, testing our prioritization uh, prior prioritization tools and our tracking of uh, defects in time. So this is all uh, for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, that was great. Um, we're, uh, we're running behind, so we're gonna, we're gonna hold any questions. We're gonna move right to University of Calgary and, and continue to our, our look at blades. And Mesa is up. Hello, everyone. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen here now. Yeah. So good morning, my name is Nisa Ganes and I'm an MSc student at the University of Calgary. And today I'll pre be presenting on my thesis entitled A Multiscale Progressive Damage Model to Estimate the Fatigue Life of Wind Turbine Blades. So this presentation will briefly cover the following, uh, the motivation, the objectives, the multiscale framework implemented, uh, some of the results and the conclusion and future work. So wind turbine blades are becoming increasingly longer and this makes it more susceptible to fatigue failure. So fatigue damage, uh, it poses a threat to the integrity of the entire wind turbine structure. And as the blades become damaged, the aerodynamic shape of the blade can change and this can lead to a decreased efficiency of the system. So as a result of these effects, it is critical to be able to predict the damage and failure so that timely decisions can be made. So the structural health and prognostic management systems require, uh, some of these systems require physics-based multi-scale models of the wind turbine blade uh, to make well-informed decisions. So in this way, uh, we can determine if dam damaged blades can be repaired or replaced before damage to other parts of the structure. Also, fatigue load mitigation strategies could be employed to maximize the energy extraction, reduce the mechanical loads, and fulfill power quality standards. So these wind turbine blades, as we all know, are just a thin-walled, slender composite structure. And currently, there are no well-established fatigue models for these uh, blades, like metals, for these composite materials, like they are for metals. 
So the common methods employed to analyze the fatigue of the blades are stress life models, which are used in the certification guidelines. And less common, but relatively more accurate models of blades involve stiffness and strength degradation or damage mechanics models. So ideally, the fatigue models for composites for this composite structure should consider the multi-scale nature of the response of the wind turbine, the physical damage mechanism, such as uh, matrix cracking and delamination. And it should also be quick to analyze uh, so that it could be included and interfaced with the structural health monitoring systems. So the main objectives of this study uh, was to include, to use a 2D finite element analysis of the blade, of the damaged blade, instead of using a 3D finite element model. So this will make the analysis a lot faster and easier to implement within structural health monitoring systems. So here first, uh, we see that here, the geometry and composite layup of the damaged blade is first modeled. And then next in this block here, instead of using 3D analyses, we use 2D finite element analyses. And this is done using an augmented BACUS uh, code. So within BACUS, we implemented a continuum damage mechanics model. And what BACUS does is that it reduces this 3D solid mechanics problem into a 2D cross-sectional domain. So as shown in this picture here, the wind turbine blade, which is uh, 90 meters in length, is split into 27 different sections, which is pretty similar to what we saw in the last presentation. And a beam finite element uh, representation of the blade is calculated. So the output of this augmented Vegas program is then fed into the uh, full wind turbine simulations. So the outputs of this are the equivalent mass and stiffness matrices of the damaged blade. And then using this information, we input, input it into this air elastic code of the full wind turbine blade. And then using this, we can get the operating parameters of the wind turbine. So this process can be carried out iteratively as damage progresses to calculate the fatigue life of the blade. So the output of the hook two feeds into Vegas and then vice versa. And then finally, when we see fiber failure, then we can calculate the fatigue life. Also based on the output of hook two, we can see and try to evaluate and develop different control strategies the wind turbine blade to minimize the fatigue loads. So here we have this overview of the multi-scale framework use to calculate the fatigue life. So first we have this CDM model, this continuum damage mechanics model, where the overall compliance matrix of a symmetric laminate is estimated as a function of the crack density. And this is done at the laminate scale. And then these results are used to calculate the damage rate. And then next, the reduction in stiffness of the wind turbine, different wind turbine sections along the blade are calculated using uh, the augmented Vegas program. And then this is finally input into HOP2 to simulate and get the loads on the blade. And again, this is fed iteratively until fiber failure. And then using all our results, we can calculate the fatigue life of the blade. So uh, just some results. These results are at the laminate scale. So here we have this uh, 0 plus 45 minus 45 symmetric uh, glass epoxy laminate under tension tension uh, fatigue loading. And this uh, continuum damage mechanics model is based on the optimal share lag analysis. And currently, it only accounts for cracks in one ply. So this is one of the limitations right now. So the CDM model uh, is used. So in the figure on the right here, we see how the modulus and the uh, Poisson's ratio change as the crack density increases. 
And the figure on this left here shows that as the cracks initiate and propagate and delaminate during the early stages, the damage variable dm, which is a function of this crack density, uh, it increases rapidly in the earlier stages. And then as the fatigue goes on, it sort of reaches the saturation point here, where the uh, crack density does not increase any, does not increase significantly. And then the power damage uh, matrix damage variable also does not increase a lot. So these results are in good agreement with the experimental data. And the main differences that we see here uh, because of the limitations of our CDM model. And this is because of the cracks. Cracks in reality will be in multiple layers. And these cracks also interface with each other. So this is all the interfacing of the cracks is also not captured in the CDM model currently. So the CDM model could be extended to capture this, these effects. So we also, from the, the results from this laminate scale was propagated into the structural scale. So we implemented damage to the main spa of the DTU reference wind turbine blade. And this is again, 19 meters in length. And this is done to showcase how the progressive damage model can be implemented. So here on the figure on the right, as the fatigue loading increases, the crack density also increases and the total blade deflection or the tip displacement also increases. However, as the crack saturation point is reached, we see that the tip displacement sort of uh, does not increase anymore. And on the right here, we see that in all directions, the torsion, edgewise, and clockwise directions, the percentage reduction in natural frequency increases as the matrix crack density increases until the region where no significant changes occur. And we see here that the torsional natural frequency was shown to have the highest uh, decrease level up to approximately 6.8%. So one of the limitations to this is that we really need to validate these with our real wind to wind structures and data. So just to conclude, uh, in this work, we implemented the continuum damage mechanics model within this 2D finite element analysis framework. And we began to look at the impact of the fatigue loads on the 10 megawatt wind turbine blade. So the next steps would include uh, also adding, instead of matrix cracking, also looking at the delamination model and also begin to account for geometry changes due to this damage. Additionally, we need, again, full validation with real wind turbine blades and data. And then we also want to analyze the performance data from POC2, from all wind turbine simulations, to see how we can use this in control strategies. And that brings us to the end. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, moving right along, uh, we're going to jump to University of Massachusetts. Uh, Murat, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Um, all right, let me try to share my screen. Can you guys see my screen now? Yep. All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Murat Inalpot, and I'm a faculty member with the uh, University of Massachusetts Falls Department of Mechanical Engineering, as well as Center for Renewable Energy. Uh, today, I will be briefly talking about a structural health monitoring approach we've been developing for the last several years uh, for wind turbine blades uh, in operation. And this approach is, uh, is kind of new that it's using uh, acoustics. Uh, everybody on the line is well aware that blades are susceptible to failures due to defects, fatigue, and weather-induced damage in the form of delaminations, edge splits, holes, cracks, etc. And unfortunately, most of these are not really being de detecting, uh, detected in real time by any uh, monitoring system or monitoring approach at this time. Uh, and the other unfortunate part is, is that uh, as far as we know, the contribution of uh, blade failures to the overall ONN costs are at the order of 12%. Um, you know, the blades in, in a real uh, onshore turbine uh, op in operation 
include gravitational loads, uh, wind loads, and other mechanical loads, obviously. And then these constitute, these cause different types of plate damage. Uh, most of them are shown on the schematic or, or on the uh, bottom left-hand side um, schematic on the slide. Uh, with the offshore configuration or with the offshore turbines, um, some of these things are uh, exacerbated even more. Uh, they are even a little bit more challenging to, to work with um, because of the added humidity, uh, slightly different sun radiation, icing conditions, lightning strikes, etc. So our uh, motivation has been uh, coming from the fact that there is no real feasible um, you know, real-time uh, condition monitoring system or approach for blades um, that we've seen out there. Um, and, and especially for, uh, you know, some of the critical damage modes like leading and trailing edge splits, um, we haven't seen anything. Um, even if, um, even though um, I, I just mentioned that there are not um, many approaches for uh, monitoring in the real field, uh, in, the, in the real uh, operation, there are very uh, well-established approaches that have been shown to uh, work. Uh, in certain studies, uh, vibration-based, acoustic emission-based, uh, thermography-based, ultrasonic, uh, fiber optics, and even camera-based approaches, they are excellent approaches and they've been shown to perform well, uh, but predominantly in a simulated or lab environment. I am yet to see a, a proof of these things working in real, um, you know, real life scenario myself. Uh, and uh, usually, the, 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 uh, one of the common reasons that these are not really suited for uh, monitoring in the field is, is that um, their damage detection rates uh, or ranges are quite limited, um, and thus you will need many of these implemented in your blades, which will add cost, um, and it's difficult to you know, add these, you know, there's additional weight, etc. cetera. Um, and some of these will be really costly or will be limited in their effectiveness. And thus, we conclude that there is a there is a clear need for a feasible condition monitoring to be developed uh, for turbine blades. The approach we are trying to implement uh, is more than inspection; it's structural health monitoring. Uh, so the process is is, is expected to be non-destructive, uh, real time or online, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll do a little bit more than just saying there is damage in the system. I was talking about a few other potential approaches that uh, we've seen out there in the literature or in the field. I uh, just wanted to do a simple comparison on the table. Um, model analysis, strain-based measurements, uh, essentially strain gauges are used here. Uh, acoustic emissions, which is a strain wave uh, decomposition or wave traveling approach. Um, still a structural approach, just like a strain gauge measurement. Fiber optics, thermal imaging, uh, camera-based photogrammetry approaches, and even uh, really cool drone imaging-based approaches. These are excellent approaches. We also adopt and use some of these for our research in our lab uh, for, our, for certain projects. But for turbine blades in real operation, we feel like they have some downsides. And um, these are the ones that are listed in the table because they, have, they are common for some of these approaches. There are also uncommon things that I couldn't fit in this table, for instance, Drone imaging is excellent, um, but how do you really have a drone inside a turbine blade and inspect the blade in operation? Um, I haven't seen an example of that just yet. So we came up with this new approach which utilizes airborne acoustics. Uh, the objective is to come up uh, and provide a low cost um, and still capable approach to reduce the need for total blade replacement and reduce the need for unscheduled maintenances and hopefully convert most of those to uh, scheduled maintenances, which are a lot less costly. Improve the turbine availability and uh, reduce the repair costs. We are hoping this approach or system will be, um, will be used both on new and existing turbines in the form of a retrofit. Uh, we are also hoping that uh, this system will be working on both onshore as well as offshore structures or, or turbines. And the overall cost should not be um, should be comparable or less than uh, what we see out there. A little bit about what this approach is all about. Um, the acoustic acoustics-based approach uh, is somewhat of an elegant approach in uh, machinery monitoring, especially for composite structures like turbine blades in operation, because they are relatively low cost, non-contact. They are not really um, not not necessarily bonded on the material itself. Uh, they are non-destructive. You're not destructing any of your components on your turbine. Uh, relatively easy implementation. 
And again, this is arguable. We shall talk about this if there are questions. Nothing is really easy if you are implementing certain things in the blade. Um, but this acoustic uh, approach or acoustics-based acoustic uh, monitoring system entails uh, a number of uh, low cost, low maintenance uh, acoustic, acoustic sensors to be implemented in the blades. Uh, you can see the schematic over on the left-hand side. I, I understand this is only schematic, but um, these acoustic sensors uh, are capturing acoustic signals um, generated by the blades within or outside the blade. And um, the hypothesis is that if there is, uh, there is damage on the blade, uh, the sensors will hear uh, something a little different. In addition to the uh, blade internal sensors, we also have a single blade uh, external sensor mounted on the tower. And I will expand that discussion a little bit more in a minute. Um, during these studies, we've also come up with some computational models and some validation studies uh, to back this up. Uh, overall, the solution entails a study of multiple areas. It's a multi-physical, multi-domain approach. Um, I will not have time to talk about many of these things, but I will be more focused on uh, the passive acoustic detection approach in the study. Um, and the other ones are, again, uh, could be discussed in a, in a larger context with more time. What is this passive approach? Well, your blade is a sealed enclosure uh, when it's, it's new or when it's fixed. Uh, and there is uh, internal sensors in it, um, schematically shown here. When the turbine is operational, your blade is ex exposed to wind. Uh, wind is flowing through and there is a boundary layer. And the internal sensors are continuously listening and acoustically interrogating your blade. And there is a certain background noise that it hears. When there is damage, and in this damage example, I'm using uh, blade external skin-based damage here. Uh, if you got some form of an edge split or crack or something like that, uh, you still have the wind coming through and creating a boundary layer. But then in this scenario, uh, the, boundary, uh, the, the boundary layer is expected to interact with your blade a little bit more, um, in, in a little bit more pronounced way. And um, the hypothesis is that you will listen something a little different. The system schematic can also be shown with the schematic over on the left-hand side. Uh, the blade internal sensors are essentially glued, uh, chemically bonded on the shear webs, and they are powered through the hub. Uh, and then um, we usually recommend having one sensor per blade cavity. Uh, to expand on that discussion, what do you mean by blade cavity? If you have a single shear web in, in your blade, uh, then you have a two, uh, two cavity blade. If you have a two shear, uh, two shear web blade, then you have three uh, sort of distinct, sometimes acoustically coupled, sometimes acoustically uncoupled cavities. So you're looking at six to nine blade internal sensors. And then uh, from the schematic uh, over on the le left hand side of the slide, you can see down tower, there's a blade external sensor to really interrogate what's happening outside. So we can distinguish the blade internal damage related signals from what's happening outside the, the machine even from within the machine coming from mechanical tones by gearbox generator, et cetera. The data collected is wireless, uh, wirelessly transmitted to the cloud using a 4G LTE uh, service. There's, uh, there are many strengths and opportunities in this uh, work, but then uh, in summary, the added value is uh, increasing repair versus replacement by detecting these things early on, uh, damage early on increase condition-based monitoring versus unscheduled, really costly maintenances, decreasing downtime and uh, maintenance costs. For my team to develop this uh, technology or approach, uh, we had to go through a number of technological steps um, and I will need to cut this short, I believe. Um, there is a chat box question here, uh, but we started with composite box experiments. We went into something on a rotating frame in the lab, the subscale turbine. Uh, wind tunnel experiments for proof of concept. Everything seemed to be working. And then we started doing experiments with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center's wind technologies uh, and testing center, WTTC. Some free field tests, some fatigue tests, where we've seen our sensors were capturing the damage uh, 110,000 cycles before a strain gauge in the nearby of the damage uh, detects, which was quite impressive. Then we went on with uh, some turbine shakedown tests in the field, working with a company called Pattern Energy. Uh, this test 
was verifying that our sensors can be really hooked up on a real machine. They were powered, they were collecting signals. And right now we are going to uh, field test with NREL. Uh, and as of, as, of it, as of we speak at this time, uh, we are continuously monitoring the turbine, which is DOEG 1.5 um, from the three of their blades. Um, and right now we are at step number eight, step number seven. And in May, 2022, we'll be testing the pattern energy Hopefully the difference there is, is that we will be collecting data for a number of months. Uh, so that's the long duration testing. Uh, with that, I guess uh, one of the questions could be, what is next? Uh, we have a scheduled offshore testing coming up uh, off of Virginia coast. And also we are looking for other collaborations um, and potentially licensing this technology to professionals who can take this beyond our level, which is TRL, TRL five to six at this time. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, our sponsors, DOE, National Science Foundation, uh, Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, as well as our NSF IUCRC um, WinStar, uh, my collaborators, Professor Mizraki, uh, Professor Lu, as well as my grad students um, who really helped uh, turn this into reality. Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, thanks, Murat. Um, uh, I think we're going to, in the interest of time, we're going we're gonna to keep holding the questions. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Lawrence Bank, uh, George Tech. Where's yours? Um, hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Happy to be here with you. Let me increase the size of this. Um, I um, thank you for uh, inviting us to present here, and um, and thank you, uh, Tom, for mentioning this issue of end of life and blade uh, recycling and repurposing. Uh, I represent a network. Uh, called the Rewind Network, and um, the U.S. component at the moment is out of Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, we have a group of about uh, 40 researchers, uh, faculty, graduate students, and undergrads working at Georgia Tech, City University of New York, University College Cork, Queen's University Belfast, and Munster Technological University in Cork, Ireland. Um, Let's quickly go through uh, what really happens at the end of life, presuming uh, that the blade comes off the turbine. Um, I understand there are many other solutions uh, relative to extension, uh, permit extension, and uh, blade extension. But now we're talking about what happens when the blade comes off primarily. I'm sure you've all heard various uh, versions of this waste hierarchy. Um, there are some additional steps often uh, added from the most preferred to the least prefer preferred, uh, going from green, I guess, to red, which is um, the worst. Uh, as we said, uh, extending the project to the blade lifetime uh, prevents actually removing the blade from the turbine. You can reuse the blade, potentially, if it comes out of service before the end of its design life and sell it on a secondhand market. You can repurpose the blade, which is what we do in Rewind, which is remanufacturing for use in a new product. Um, then comes recycling, where you shred, grind, mill, and use for a filler in maybe other forms of reinforced uh, composites, plastics, or um, sometimes in concrete. You can use techniques of material recovery, sometimes called reclamation. There are a whole host of uh, techniques to um, uh, remove the resin from the fiber, recover the resin monomers uh, and the fibers, and then hopefully reuse those materials uh, as uh, recycled materials in essentially any uh, composite uh, uh, application. Um, then going further down the list of treatment and disposal, uh, what is becoming somewhat popular these days is the co-processing in a cement kiln. 
which is really substituting for coal and substituting for uh, silica uh, in the uh, manufacturing of cement. Um, then you incinerate with or without energy recovery. And then finally, you get the landfilling. Landfilling is already um, uh, being outlawed in many European countries. We expect that to come uh, to North America relatively soon. Um, the hope is that we move up this inverted pyramid and um, try to first consider the more sustainable uh, end of life options and then consider the less sustainable options after we've exhausted opportunities for the more sustainable options. Um, we, as I say, are a consortium that has been working now in um, repurposing for five years. Um, in fact, working in all types of end of life uh, opportunities, um, some of them in the material recovery, recovery and recycling for the last uh, 10 years. And we have determined that our effort is going to now focus only on repurposing. So repurposing is taking a blade or a portion of a blade and using it in large infrastructure. Um, there's also the architectural repurposing uh, in products such as uh, furniture and um, other smaller items. Uh, but our focus is really on using blades uh, as large infrastructure items. Uh, we have uh, accurate models obtained from LIDAR scanning of a number of blades, and we've used these blades to render different types of solutions uh, in um, what we call our Rewind catalog that we published last fall and we'll be soon publishing a new one. This is what the catalog looks like. Just to give you some idea of the concepts, we started early on looking at components um, of the blade for potential housing. Um, roof panels, whole roofs, doors, uh, various other parts that can be cut from the blade uh, in, in a sense to replace conventional construction materials. Um, a bridge of different types of varieties and different types of options, symmetric, asymmetric, continuous side girders, girders under the um, uh, roadway or the deck. Um, a blade pole, which is using a potential a, a pole as a transmission power line, uh, or as a communications tower for uh, communications equipment. In place of if you if you know the artificial trees that are used um, quite regularly, barriers. Um, there are various and all types of barriers that can be developed: noise barriers, wind barriers. Um, various barriers in the ocean and even ocean rise barriers we, we, we um, hypothesize. In the farming community where most of these blades are in fact situated in the, in the United States, uh, we've looked at different kinds of options for using blades, pieces of, of blades in, for instance, feed bunks uh, that are shown there uh, with those cows out in the field. We've looked at a number of solutions related to, to um, using the composite where it's most uh, appropriate, if you will, which is in the ocean, because as we know, these composites are very durable uh, in ocean environments, um, either as jetties, sometimes called groins, to prevent uh, sea, uh, sand erosion at beaches, very common in um, particular beaches that have uh, high tidal zones. Um, and also we've been looking at a project related to floating PV platforms. These would be very large platforms, uh, potentially far offshore that could be used for uh, 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 floating PV systems. Um, those are the renderings. We have completed two full-scale projects. Uh, in January of 2022, we completed a bridge in Cork, Ireland. This is a bridge on a greenway, which is a cycleway and pedestrian walkway near Cork Island. It's a 23 kilometer greenway in total. And we used a relatively small or quite small uh, LM 13.4 meter blade um, that was um, 
obtained from a asset manager in um, Belfast, in fact. Um, the bridge um, has a, the, the, the blades are used as girders on either side of the uh, bridge. They extend out into the landscape past the deck. The idea um, really, and this was supported by uh, the Cork County Council, uh, was to demonstrate uh, an interesting reuse opportunity or what we call a repurposing opportunity uh, that will be very visible to the public and hopefully inspire other um, similar repurposing uses. Uh, the, the deck system in this case is uh, metallic, uh, steel beams and steel plates. We have another project involving um, a timber beam and timber deck um, now uh, starting in Northern Ireland. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the engineering that goes behind this, uh, full engineering plans, full details of the blade, we section the blade, we create structural models, we uh, ass assess those models uh, with respect to loadings through finite element models and structural analysis models, and we have done full scale tests of parts of the blade. Um, please contact us if you want uh, more information about um, uh, the publications we have related to those. Uh, the second um, application that is almost installed, but uh, soon to be installed, is an application which we are quite excited about, uh, which we call Blade Pole. And that's to use either the full blade or a portion of the blade uh, as a electric uh, transmission uh, tower. Um, we have done numerous um, analytical studies that show uh, that blades are significantly over-designed, if you will, with respect to the needs for a transmission tower and can carry transmission tower loads uh, with um, large factors of safety. Uh, the difficulty and the analysis that took place relative to using the blades was to understand the um, how you would connect uh, the cables to the blade and particularly how you would uh, create that connection on the blade that was durable um, and would be able to uh, uh, carry the load successfully. We worked with a number of partners on this project. Uh, NL Green Power has uh, sponsored the project thus far. Hubble uh, Power Systems have provided all of the full-size uh, insulators uh, that you can see in that um, uh, full-scale test rig that we have in the lab. Essentially, from our analysis, we find that the most critical part of the blade with respect to this blade pole application is going to be at the points of connection near the top of the blade where the blade is um, um, less stiff then down at the bottom of the blade. The current solution is to actually anchor the blade uh, using the um, um, bolts at the base of the blade. Uh, this is a technique that has been used in other places as well, and to use a concrete foundation. Um, we have exceeded the design load capacity uh, of this portion of the blade in full scales test uh, significantly. This is, by the way, a GE 37 blade, came out of a wind farm in Kansas, Smoky Hills it's called, and um, provided by um, NL Green Power and shipped by Logisticus. Um, the second phase of the installation is going to be a, a full-scale installation out at the Smoky Hills farm in Kansas. Uh, we intend to, and this is hopefully going to happen within the next six months to a year, um, we intend to look at a number of critical details with respect to poles, um, the tangent pole, the dead end pole, and also the corner poles, uh, which uh, carry more uh, complex loads because the blades have, in fact, bidirectional capacity, as we know uh, from the... Um, uh, different modes uh, of loading when used as a blade, um, we feel that uh, this is a, um, a really useful uh, application. 
Of course, the logistics of moving blades at near full size in the field will need to be resolved and it will need to be seen whether or not these competitive. Uh, the, I should mention that the system we're talking about now is for large transmission towers. So these are between, um, let me convert to metric, around 30 meters high uh, to 40 meters high. This is a GE 37, which is 37 meters high. And these are intended to carry a 345 kilovolt load. Uh, so these are the larger uh, uh, transmission poles. Uh, we could, of course, use parts of the blade for smaller transmission poles, but we feel the advantages in these larger, higher poles that carry uh, more loads. Um, let me just acknowledge our partners and funding. We have been funded um, significantly by the National Science Foundation uh, through regular grants, through Partnership for Innovation grants, and through i grants from NYSERDA initially, Science Foundation Ireland, Department for the Economy in Northern Ireland, and NL Green Power. We are working with Logisticus, NL, Siemens Gamesa. Uh, we hope to do a, another bridge project in the US with Siemens Gamesa shortly. Uh, Cork County Council, we have had extended discussions with New York City Department of Design and Construction, who are gearing up for our nine gigawatts of offshore power in the New York City region, uh, which is um, clearly going to require all sorts of new technologies and manufacturing facilities in the area. And we've worked with NREL. We do also sit on the IEA um, task Committee 45, not 46, 45 is the new task committee related to end of life recycling and repurposing of wind blades. Um, I will end with that. I will um, encourage you to join uh, our um, uh, consortium called Rewind Network. You can visit us on the, uh, on the web at uh, rewind.info. Uh, we, look, we are looking for responsible, what we call decommissioning of wind turbine blades, uh, first repurposing the parts that can't be repurposing, move further down the chain on the um, waste management hierarchy. Uh, we would love to work more with industry, particularly in Canada. Um, we would love to build a bridge or any other type of system out in Canada, uh, Canada to demonstrate this technology. We are working closely with um, uh, a Canadian consultant, Jody Ride Out, who I believe is on this call still, and uh, helping to uh, uh, develop uh, realistic designs for our uh, in-service uh, blade pole uh, project. Uh, we're happy to sign NDAs uh, to work with us to develop particularly predictions of the types and quantities of blades that are coming out of service. The repurposing is tremendously dependent on location. The idea is that you find a solution that requires repurposing, a need for repurposing in the vicinity of the blades that are coming out of service. So if there's a requirement, for instance, we're looking at a project in Iowa at the moment for a parking, um, outside parking lot canopy uh, using uh, decommissioned blades, and there are many blades, as we know, in Iowa in that area. Not far from, as we know, up, uh, up the road is uh, Saskatchewan, uh, where we would be happy to look um, at other kinds of uh, blades. For those of you in the assessment monitoring, and we've heard a lot of that in this session, which is a tough job. I admire all the work that you guys are trying to do to predict and extend the life of blades. Uh, we really think uh, this is, this is uh, life. good, but we also need cost-effective ways to screen those blades that are being decommissioned. At the moment, we do extensive, if you will, sectioning of blades and measuring of uh, fibers um, and locations and types um, in order to determine uh, the internal structure of the blade for use as an infrastructure item. This is not reverse engineering. We don't ever intend to use these as or to build new blades, 
So the requirements that we have are actually quite different from reverse engineering. We only need those properties that we feel would be important, say in a bridge or a barrier or a floating platform. So we'd love to work with you to determine cost-effective ways to determine whether a blade is in fact uh, suitable for a repurposing application. Uh, we also need, uh, of course, cost models for blade removal, cutting and transportation. Those of you in the business know uh, that uh, decommissioning is um, a moving target, if you will. And um, it is difficult to determine where all the costs go and therefore how our savings uh, in uh, using repurposing solutions can benefit everybody in the system. Uh, remembering, of course, that when we repurpose, we use the blade as a structural element and we exploit the um, very um, high quality uh, strength and stiffness properties of the structure. Any other system that grinds down the blade really downcycles the material to a lower cost product. Uh, so if we can use the blade in a higher cost product and exploit its structural and material properties, I believe we're looking at um, an advantage on both sides. Um, please uh, help us demonstrate rewind designs in your communities, and we are open to uh, all sorts of collaborations. Uh, please contact us um, at our website or um, at either of our uh, universities. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Uh... Yeah, it's it's a new topic here um, in Canada and uh, one that's coming, uh, I think, sooner rather than later. Uh, so appreciate those insights. Um, so we're now going to get into a bit of a discussion. I apologize, Marianne, where we are over time a little bit, but we've got uh, we do have some time. Uh, and I see Phil has a question in the chat. Uh, and uh, Phil, why don't you why don't you unmute yourself and ask the question real time, so to speak. Uh, and while you're doing that, that'll give others a chance to to come up with a few of their own. Yeah, sure. Um fantastic to see all of those repurpose uh applications there the question that came to mind for me right away i see this pole sticking up out of the ground does that thing want to fly um is it uh, trying to generate lift and does that cause challenges on the foundation side loading as it tries to tip itself over uh but that's what came to mind first yeah that's that's the, the, the question most people ask and thank you for bringing that up uh, yeah, we've done studies that, you know, typical um, uh, winds, speeds of winds relative to the type of speeds that the blades are experiencing in service, you know, we've got a tip speed of, you know, 150, 200 mile, uh, miles an hour with a blade, and we've got wind speeds up to, say, 40, 50 miles an hour. Um, we've done simulations with respect to the kind of loadings we see with infrastructure poles. And we see no problem with either the deflections, which we typically take as um, a tenth of the height, or um, you know the strength of these uh, blade poles. They are very flexible, uh, which is great, uh, and they are strong. Uh, so we have not seen, although we haven't put one in service yet, and that's the purpose of building this uh, demonstration, um, to uh, determine whether we will get any aerodynamic effects related to uh, the shape of the blade when it is in service. Of course, a pole doesn't move around like a wind turbine, and it's only going to be in one orientation. Uh, so we can, you know, figure that out if you will. Yeah, fascinating. But thanks for the question. Thanks for the yeah. question, Phil. It's it's the first question that comes to mind. So great one. Uh, Andrea, I see you got your hand up. Hi. Um, so thanks for that presentation. Um, I love that we're starting to think about life cycle design and not just O&M and that we're taking the whole life cycle approach to this in, in the circular economy. So I think that's great. Um, my question is for Lawrence and I was wondering with the amount of blades that you'll be repurposing in, in this plan, what percentage are usable according to these applications that you're finding? And then what potential design changes need to happen that if you've, if you've thought through this um, upstream 
in order so that when we do repurpose these blades, um, they can do other things rather than having to do it on the back end? Uh, well, um, two great questions. And, you know, the reason why we have focused on uh, infrastructure applications is that because we know there are going to be lots and lots of blades coming out of service. We're talking, you know, thousands a year now in, in the US and probably Canada uh, due to repowering and we expect a lot more repowering. So we were looking, we are looking at solutions where we can use a lot of blades. Uh, while we understand you can cut them up into furniture, but you can make a lot of little chairs from a, a 60 meter blade. Uh, so bridges are a popular, you know, a, a nice application. Although once again, how many pedestrian bridges are you going to build uh, in the world? Uh, power poles is a very nice one because there we have evidence that there will be, you know, expansions to the network and grid, um, you know, coming online in the next 10, 20 years, even next year. Um, so we know that's, that's happening. And the nice part is that it it fits the life cycle of the energy sector, right? You're taking this at wash producing wind and now it's carrying the power away from the, the new wind farm. Um, barriers we think are a really good option. You use lots and lots of blades if we're using for tidal barriers, uh, these beach groins or jetties, uh, floating platforms. Um, I didn't show in my presentation, but if you've seen a photograph of floating uh, PV platforms, these are hectares large, extremely large platforms, um, you know, and if you are near the coast and many wind farms are near the coast, moving the blade or parts of the blade into the ocean environment or into inland lakes, uh, where a lot of the PV systems are. Of course, the other questions related to floating PV and the environment that people do get into, but they are being uh, uh, considered. One thing I will emphasize, we don't expect all of the blades and every blade to be, you know, repurposed. You know, we, we imagine in the long term that if you could get 20% of the blade repurposed, that would be great. You know, you're taking 20% of these, you know, expensive, you know, hundred to two hundred thousand dollar structures, and you're using them in a second life application where that you know, superior properties and structural um, form are used. A lot of people actually like the shape when they see it. A lot of people, of course, don't like the shape. So we also feel there's a, a good side to this. And we feel in Ireland, that was the, the reason that the county council was very interested in is, is that, you know, it fits with the whole circular economy, green, uh, the notion that we're trying to do something, and we've done surveys actually in um, Ireland, that communities that are very opposed to wind, uh, and there is quite an anti-wind um, lobby in Ireland, interestingly enough, even though they expect to go to 50% wind power, you know, soon, um, those communities actually are not opposed to using these blades in infrastructure applications. In fact, you know, it's kind of the good side, if you will, of that. And we're, we're happy to see that. Uh, we are hoping to do quite a few more on, um, on the, you know, on Ireland, Northern and, uh, and the Republic, uh, and then hopefully other uh, parts of Europe. It's important to note that the inventory of blades in Europe and in the US Canada are quite different. You know, here we have the long blades, essentially 37 meters or 40 meters and up. Uh, whereas in Europe, because they started 20 years before, there are tons of these off-grid small little blades that are, you know, rotating the N29s, the Intercon 29s, all of the Vestas V27s, 29s, 44s, 42s, 50s. All of these are small blades that are coming out of service in Europe and can be quite easily transported and used uh, for these infrastructure applications. So it's important to know the location, uh, as I said before, uh, of, of the source of the blades and what is needed in the local community. But sorry for the long-winded answer, Andrea. Um, you know, Thank Andrea, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'm excited about this. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a question from Rob um, in the chat. Uh, Rob, do you want me to ask or do you want to come off camera? And I'm not sure. I don't think it's directed to any one individual uh, of our panelists. 
Yes. So I'll just read the question. Um, is the reason for the focus on blade issues is that the blade is the most critical component in asset management or that generator and gearbox issues are more turbine supplier specific and more difficult to research? Uh, so I, Lawrence, you've had a lot of airtime. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. Like you might have some to say on that as well. I just want to know if <laughs> any of our other speakers have uh, have uh, some thoughts on on Rob's question. And if not, of course, Lawrence. Yeah, I, I would say that, of course, in the end of life uh, options, um, you know, that people say eighty five percent of the turbine is recyclable. So the tower is pretty uh, typically metal, the foundation concrete, you might have a concrete tower. Uh, all the machinery is metal. Um, so it's really only the fiberglass yeah. parts that are difficult to recycle. And that's Sorry. the blade and maybe parts of the nacelle and maybe the hub and things like that. But that's, where, that's what's getting all the attention in the- No, I'm, I'm not talking about recycling. I'm talking about asset management of, of yeah, the yeah, fleet. Yeah, no, no, I agree. So, no, I my, thought you were. My, so my question really is, there's not a single paper or presentation on gearbox and, and, and generators. And yet I, my sense, and maybe I'm wrong, is that that is an com, uh, important component uh, that needs to be managed so is the focus on blades is because blades are the most critical component to be focused on for asset management and gearbox and, and generators are much less important? Charles, why don't you take a crack at that? If that's what your yeah. hand is up for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, was, uh, that was the reason why. And, and I think, you know, we've had a more blade focused, um, you know, session today, uh, but I'd say that as, asset manager and Phil talked about the, the Canaria operation and maintenance summit. And, you know, I've attended this a few years now and it's a concern. So uh, I think when you talk about main components of a turbine, you'll have uh, the drivetrain, of course. And so like main bearings, um, gearbox generator, uh, the converters as well uh, for, for some of those machines. Um, and there's there's a whole pan of research on condition monitoring system. I think it was you know briefly introduced today, but there's actually quite a lot of suppliers, um, you know, with commercial uh, condition monitoring system specifically targeted at at gearbox, for example. So it's a concern as well. It, I think our our session today was mostly focused on blades, but it's definitely on the on the asset management part. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of, of companies working on those uh, major components replacement, uh, like generator gearbox and such. So, it's it's a it's a like I wouldn't say blade is more critical necessarily than a gearbox if you're an asset manager of, of a wind farm. Phil. Yeah. yeah, I I love the question, Rob, because it's a it's I think highlighting something that might be a trend, but I'm a little cautious to say it out loud in the sense that a lot of the vibration monitoring that has taken place on the on the drivetrain has gone commercial. Now it's been commercialized successfully and you have a lot of companies as Charles mentioned who are in the business. Um, that's not to say that there aren't people measuring the blades, but they are very difficult to get a read on. Uh, it's hard to know. Uh, yeah. how they're doing. Whereas with a, a fast rotating equipment, we've been doing this for over a century. Uh, and so we should be able to, to uh, really pull out the natural frequencies and that kind of thing. However, the skeptic in me says that I think a lot of operators still don't know what to do with all that data. And so they've got somebody who sold them a commercialized package for uh, monitoring vibrations and that kind of thing. And they're left with a vibration signature. And then the question is, is good or bad? Um, is it going to break? How long do I have? Please tell me this is going to make it to the summer in the low wind season. And, and there's still, I think, a lot of work to do to consolidate all that information from the blade tip th to, through to down tower at the foundation. What does all this data mean? Somebody please help me make an informed decision because I'm getting a different answer from all of my vendors. Thank you. What to do with all that data? 
Um, I have a, uh, so just open up if anyone else has any other questions. Um, Murad, I, uh, I'm interested in the acoustic work um, and, and kind of the validation that's that's happening. Is are, are you are you going down the IEC path uh, in that and, and looking for um, certification of this approach in some fashion? Uh, are you are you teaming it up with with other, um, I guess more uh, for lack of a better word, industry accepted currently accepted approaches to that? Um, what's your what's what's your plan in that regard? Yeah, thank you for the question, Tom. Um, I mean, we are not really um, <clears throat> at the point of commercializing just yet, but we are about to turn that corner. Uh, we are still working on the on different aspects of this technology. Um, for instance, uh, when you listen to something with a with an acoustic sensor, uh, you know, simple words, microphone, uh, even uh, you know, the temperature of the environment will really shift the acoustic signatures signatures you'll be collecting. So your baseline is continuously shifting. And for those, uh, we are developing machine learning based approaches to keep track of the norm, so to speak. And then any, any deviation from that norm is captured. And uh, we are still working out those details. You know, it's not really completely done. Um, that's why it's still at a university level. But um, arguably, uh, because we've now shown this in the field, working, collecting data, uh, at NREL and at Pattern Energy Wind Farm in Texas. Again, it's arguable, but I think we are about TRL 5.6. Um, in terms of standardization, I, I'm afraid to tell you <laughs> that there is no standard in blade monitoring uh, from a you know, operational standpoint, but maybe some of these technologies that are being developed right now uh, can help standardize them. Uh, at least as far as I know, there is no standard. Um, Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so just opening up the floor again to uh, to other questions or comments. Hearing none, all questions and uh, uh, thoughts have been addressed. Uh, I think, Marianne, I'll turn it back to you. Sure. Thank you, Tom. And Thank you to everybody who presented and attended today. It is another great session. Um, and this is this wraps up this year's um, Canadian Wind Energy Research Network. Um, in the coming weeks, you should expect an email with links to the recordings of these presentations. And um, yeah, and I'm sure you'll be hearing from us throughout the year. Thank you all. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks, Phil, and the rest of the steering committee for putting this together. Uh, look forward to uh, to next year, and of course the uh, the proceedings from this one. Thank you, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.